Okay, checking, 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 going like that. Checking, checking, one, two, one, two. Checking, aren't you guys glad that you came live today? Checking, checking, checking. Um, can, okay, all right. Do we feel like we're going to have a solution to this or, yeah, Micah's pretty confident because otherwise I could, yeah, we're good? Chip. Okay, okay, outside voice. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure like who has gotten this uh, update or if you uh, know this about me, I don't like talk about it a, a ton, but um, uh, like a few months ago, I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD and um, have, uh, ha have been uh, taking a, a pretty like a mild medication for that. And uh, on my way here this morning, I uh, realized that I had forgotten to take it. It's like a daily thing. And I thought, but that's a, it's fine. Um, I, can, I can handle that. Uh, I can tell you that my brain right now is, uh, uh, it's sad that I don't, that I hadn't taken my medication this morning. <laughs> just right now, there's just a lot. Uh, so thank you for your patience as we get this thing pulled together. Thank you. Doug is uh, Doug's going to pray for me. Our uh, our key passage is from Ephesians chapter two, verses one through ten. Do you want me to test this one? Ephesians. So if you have a Bible or uh, a Bible app and want to open it to Ephesians chapter two, uh, Ephesians chapter two, verses one through ten. We're checking. Wired mic. Wired mic. We're good. Love is patient. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, everyone online. Uh, Man, so part of the challenge of constantly working on this building and this space is uh, we just like we don't know exactly what's going to happen from week to week. So thank you for your patience, folks who are online. Thank you for your patience, everyone in this room. Hello, everyone in this room. Good morning. Hello, everyone who's tuning in online. Thank you for tuning in. I had already shared uh, with the with the people in the room just a quick update the conflict that. We had prayed about that uh, that Kurt Olson was going through in Nigeria has been resolved to the point that uh, things are better now than they would have been apart from the conflict. Um, we're going to put a link in the chat to some resources, including a resource for you to discover your uh, personal conflict style. Because when we know how we tend to handle conflict and how other people tend to handle conflict, we tend to work better together. So that is, uh, is going to be in the chat. We encourage you to go through that inventory before next week Sunday because the teaching next week Sunday is going to be about conflict in the church and how to handle it more like Christ. I also want to let you know, so you can put it on your calendar, the week of March 5th, we're inviting people to come into this building. we got three different times. We're having a dessert reception. We're getting like a, a cool platter of, uh, of, of goodies uh, from Becca's Cafe down the road, and there will be refreshments here, and we're doing it three different times. They happen to be the three different times that small groups meet because we're asking small groups to come here, do your meeting here with me 
and get some updates on the vision for New Day, where we're headed, uh, some updates on where we have been, uh, a little tour of some of the improvements that are happening in this space and some of the improvements that are going to happen in the 49 days between now and Easter so that we can safely and enthusiastically welcome the public to celebrate Easter with us in this space. Last week, I mentioned three things to pray about that uh, I, I didn't give you time to, um, uh, to, to write down, and there are some, some updates in there, too. Uh, first of all, pray for the Samburu, the, the, uh, uh, the, the tribe that we've adopted in northern Kenya. There is, it is the worst drought uh, that they've experienced in East Africa in a long, long time. And what our partner there, LifeWay Missions International, what they've been able to do is buy a water truck, which is a big deal. Yeah, we're so grateful for that because the water availability has been so spotty that now for people in, in villages that they're serving, they don't have to worry about whether or not a truck is going to be available or what the price is going to be on that particular day. Um, they can serve people uh, on demand, which is great. So pray for the Samburu. Thank God for those uh, for, for that purchase of the water truck. Uh, pray for Marathon County that our eyes would be open to the ways that we can push back darkness and bring the light of Christ within our own county. Um, Fifty thousand plus people who aren't connected to, uh, to to any church at all, and and pray for New Day. Uh, for people to reconnect so, so that we can live out God's instructions to receive and reflect his love together. Uh, let's pray together right now before we jump into God's word. God, we do thank you that we've got these uh, partners uh, internationally who have been so blessed so that they can be a blessing to others. We pray, God, that your gospel would go out with that, with that truck, with the, the blessings that they're able to literally pour out, um, let them also overflow with your love. And in addition to our, our partners around the world, uh, we pray for the people across the street, the, the people who we run into where we live, work, play, and learn. We pray, God, that you'd be drawing people closer to you. And we pray for New Day this uh, family of, of, of believers who just have a desire to receive and reflect love from you. God, I pray that you'd keep us united, that we'd learn from your word today and not just learn to learn, that we'd learn to obey so that we can honor you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today, we're going to take a look at some things that are difficult to believe. Um, we're going to jump right into God's word. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Ephesians is a, a letter that Paul wrote to a gathering of disciples in a place called Ephesus. They already heard the good news about Jesus. They surrendered their lives to Jesus as their king. And now Paul is coaching them from a distance and helping them understand and live out their faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, it starts in verse 1. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. So, of course, Paul is talking about like a spiritual death here. Um, they weren't like literally physically dead. So we have, we have this image of uh, people who are spiritually dead, and he's saying it to his audience were people like us. It suggests to us that once we were spiritually dead, he continues, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like anyone else. So it's hard for some people to believe 
that there is a spiritual realm, that there's an unseen world, that there is a devil and an adversary, that there's evil. And yet, at the same time, it's not difficult to look around and see how people act and some of the situations that are happening in the world and acknowledge, okay, yeah, some of that we we could call evil. And, And it's not all that big of a stretch to look into our own hearts and see that we're capable under the right circumstances of evil. Michelle and I were watching a show. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to worry about the title of the show because I don't want you to think we're sinners. Um, but I, there was an interesting quote in there where uh, somebody, said, uh, somebody said, everyone is capable of murder. You just have to re- meet the right person. And I think there's some, some truth to that, that we all have the capacity for evil in us. So even though we might hear, read what Paul said, and we might meet people who say, I don't believe in an un, unseen spiritual realm, uh, and yet cultures throughout history around the world have not felt like that's much of a stretch. Maybe our enlightened view is missing something. So some of this there are some parts that are not really that hard to believe, that there's evil that leads to a a spiritual death. Paul continues, though, that God offers a way out. In verse 4, but God is so rich in his mercy and he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. There's a lot in this passage about Jesus. And for some people, even if they can accept that there's evil in the world, they may have a hard time accepting that there is a God who loves us so much that he sent his son. And yet here's what Paul is reminding these gathered disciples about. You were dead in your sin, and you've been raised to new life because God sent his son who died and rose again. And for some people, like that is hard to believe. But that's not even the hardest part to believe. I mean, most of the people in this room or who are tuning in online have heard that message and and have believed. That's not the hardest part to believe. It is the most important part. Like, I mean, that's the key. This next part is a mind blower. So Paul explains to us in Ephesians 2 that there is evil that leads to death and God offers a way out. And the mind blower is that the way out is not by being a good person. He continues in verse 8. He said, God saved you by his grace. Grace is a gift, an undeserved gift. Saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. This is hard for a lot of people to believe. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. Why is this so hard to believe? Partly because the the death, the spiritual death, the separation, the damnation, the eternal separation from God seems to be a punishment for the bad things we have done. So if that's caused by the bad things that we've done, wouldn't it make sense that we would then do good things to counterbalance that? The problem is that once we're separated from God by sin, we're dead in our sin. There's no good that we could do that would regenerate life. We're doomed. It's like if someone had a, a, a heart attack and their heart stopped and you approached them and said, you really need to eat better. 
You know, you need to uh, exercise more. But it doesn't really do any good. What they need is someone to intercede, someone to do CPR. Now, is that, am I saying the right thing? Is that what somebody would need to do? Like, we got somebody in here who's in, in nursing. And so, like, I, do, I just, uh, I think that's what you would do. Um, but we have experts here. Um, it wouldn't be something you could just say to do yourself. There would have to be intercession. And that's what God does through Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can bring the dead back to life. So most of us in this room, though, have understood by now that salvation is by grace alone, not by the good works that we do. And so he, for some of us, here's where it gets really difficult to believe. We, we can accept that there's evil in the world that leads to spiritual death and that God offers a way out and it's not by being a good person so that no one can boast. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's not about our righteousness. And then Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says in verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are God's masterpiece, his workmanship. The Greek word that Paul uses here is where we get our word for poetry. It's like we are an expression of God's heart, like the work of an artist. Why is that hard to believe a lot of the time? Maybe, maybe because you know yourself. You've been taught to recognize and to cover up those aspects of yourself that cause you shame because you expect them to cause other people, if they knew you, that they'd see those aspects of you and they'd feel disgusted or angry or even afraid if they really knew you. Oh, and when some of that leaks out, we definitely do not feel like a masterpiece. And then in addition to what we see within ourselves, we're constantly getting messages from people around us about our value we're worthy of their love as long as we operate within their expectations of us. Or, or we're worthy of a, a certain level of, of pay because of the, the market value of our skills, what we have to offer, our level of education or knowledge or expertise. And if the market changes, then our value changes, our ability to purchase the things that the world sees as valuable changes. Even in a church setting, we have some sense that certain people could leave the church and that would be okay, whereas others leaving could cause major disruption. So some people are more valuable than others, right? Yesterday, we had a group of people here. I was so grateful uh, uh, for a, a work day and, um, and, and got a bunch of stuff done. And some people were here, like, stayed later. And as the hours went on, I was thinking, man, some of us got to get home and get ready for work tomorrow. Because I knew I had to get ready to be here to work. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not really the guy who has the option to go, you know, I'm really tired. Uh, this Sunday morning, I'm, I think I'm just going to stay uh, stay in in bed. But we've so we've kind of created a church environment where it's not okay for me to stay in bed, right? It wouldn't be okay for Heidi to stay home. Heidi, we need you. You're important. You're valuable. Some of these other people, though, if they didn't show up, it's no big deal. I mean, it's just the way we've kind of structured. Things. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying these kinds of things 
are realities that, ki- that we can draw conclusions from. And yet apparently God measures beauty and value differently from the world. That's, it should be no surprise, right? And, and before I go any further in helping you see that you personally, individually have value and beauty beyond what you and the world can measure, I want to remind you that when we look at the text, Paul isn't addressing this message to an individual. We are God's masterpiece. This is not a self-esteem seminar where you simply look in the mirror and tell yourself that you're a masterpiece every morning, although that might be a really good start. You, instead of thinking just of yourself as, you know, you look in the mirror and you see the Mona Lisa, Think of what Paul is describing as a a gallery installation, a purposeful expression of his artistic voice that's full of unique and wonderful and beautiful pieces that when taken together are a fuller expression of his workmanship. We fit together to express the heart of the artist. Every unique piece is priceless, and together, they are his masterpiece. We, people who have died to our old sinful self and unconditionally surrendered to Jesus as our king, we together are God's exhibition of beauty and value and redemption and his kingdom, his creativity, his glory. So even though I can look around and like go, well, I'm, not, I'm not as good a teacher as Francis Chan, for instance. So am I really, am I valuable? Uh, he seems more valuable than I am. Or there's the church down the street that, never has technical issues with their live stream, are they more valuable than, uh, than, than us? No, we can celebrate. I can celebrate Francis Chan. We can celebrate the church down the street because together, not just the people in this room, together, those people who are fully surrendered to Jesus the King, together, we are God's masterpiece. And God gives us all good works to do in response to what he has already done to save us. Those good works that God has planned for you, that's your ministry. And it's something more beautiful than filling a blank on an organizational chart. So things are a little different at New Day these last couple of years, and that's part of the reason because we're experimenting with a new philosophy of ministry. Almost three years ago, we had a a meeting right in this room. This room looked very different. A meeting with uh, ministry team leaders. So we had an information technology leader. We had uh, uh, the the trailer ministry leader, the setup teardown leader, like uh, uh, the, the family ministries team leader, all these team leaders of teams that we had who made things operate the way we wanted them to operate when we were meeting in the middle school. And when all of that blew up because of COVID, we had to step back and go, okay, none of this is relevant right now. We have to rebuild. What do we want rebuilding to look like? And as we talked about that as as a group of leaders, we decided what would be more beautiful than being someone whose job it is to recruit people to fill positions on an organizational chart so that those people can fill blanks on a calendar, to recruit volunteers, to schedule volunteers. What might be more beautiful is to have the kind of environment where everybody was empowered and equipped to participate, where 
instead of going, well, who's going to be on the schedule to make coffee this week? We had the kind of culture and the kind of environment where everybody knows how to use the coffee maker. And when somebody saw we're low on coffee, they knew this is my family. This is my living room, essentially. I can make the coffee. Instead of scheduling somebody to pick up a piece of paper that fell on the floor, let's, let's equip and let's empower. Instead of scheduling somebody to be in different positions of the building in order to make sure that people feel welcome, let's have the kind of culture where people are always watching, where people know that if there's no one who's standing by the front door, I can stand by the front door because that's important. And we're not there yet. We haven't got all that set and in, 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 in figured out. Uh, what we want to do is have that kind of environment so that we can give people the opportunity to find out what gets your motor running. Like, as you practice those things, what do you get excited about? And when you're using your giftedness that God gave you, when you're living in your uniqueness, you're going to shine in different ways. You're going to find a sweet spot. And that's the church's opportunity to go, we see something happening in you. How can we help you do more of that? And instead of starting with an organizational chart that's full of blanks, start with kind of an ooze. Uh, 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 a, a petri dish. I'm sorry. It's not how I wrote it in my notes. See what organically grows and feed it and see what happens from there. As we abide in Christ, as we stick with Him, as we focus on being a community of people who are connecting to Christ, see what fruit. He grows. He's the vine. We're the branches. As we stay connected to him, he grows the fruit. And I'm afraid all of our organizational charts and calendars of the past restricted what he might do. Now I know even me sitting up here communicates that I'm somehow more valuable and more important. That is, I, I, I don't like that. Um, I, I'm like, for you, for you folks at home, like I'm the guy on the screen. You don't even see the other people in the room. Like how valuable are they? You can't even see them. Like I don't like what that communicates. And yet we're in a, a culture, we're in a North American church culture where we've got this weird thing where we want to be feeding the, the organic church, and yet we're living in an organizational structure. So I just, I want to give you this. I want to close with, with this idea uh, as we're straddling these two ideas and, and trying to be the church as uh, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to describe it in Ephesians 2, where you get to be the unique masterpiece that you are, even in this, this context. We're, uh, I'll give you an analogy. We're a hybrid, like, like a hybrid car, where there's a, a combustion engine that runs on gasoline, and there's also an electric engine. And the two help each other out, even though mechanically they're very different from each other. Again, I'm like looking around the room and like, does anybody know? Is, are they very mechanically different from each other? Yes, I think so. Um, and yet, both of those propel the car in the same direction. And what we're seeing, uh, just to take the analogy a, a, a little bit further, what we're seeing in the auto industry is a movement away from the combustion engine and more towards the electric engine. What we're seeing in the North American church is that we've been running church with a certain engine. 
we find a place, we find a person to sit up front and, and do the teaching. We set things up in rows and people come in and kind of participate uh, in, in uh, the, the religious ceremony and that can look different. And then they go home and they feel good about what they've experienced. And that's a lot of what we understand church to be in North America. And what I'm suggesting is that's the gasoline engine. And we're seeing generations rise up who are not at all interested in church that way. Now, all of us are. That's why you're here. I mean, we have a certain level of comfort with that. We like that to some extent. If we're not investing in a church model that is not dependent on the building, the person, the, the, the key teacher, if we're not investing in a model that is more relational, uh, that takes us outside of this building and gets you in a conversation with somebody who would never walk into a church building or attend a church event or watch a live stream or participate in the church in any way, and yet God is stoking in them a, a realization that there's evil in the world, that's stoking in them a hunger for some solution because they've tried everything and, and they, nothing is working to fill that void, and God is stoking in them a hunger for his son as the solution to the deepest problems they have in their soul. If our biggest answer is, you should come to my church and decide whether or not you like church culture, we're going to mess things up. We've got to be able to go to that person and say, here is how I connect with Jesus in a way that you can connect with Jesus right where you are in your sphere of influence. You don't have to come and decide whether or not you want to be part of my culture. Within your culture, Jesus wants to save you. Get around some other people who are hungry like you are. And let's see what happens when we make disciples outside of the church walls because we can build churches and hope that disciples are made what we see in scripture is where disciples are made, there you find the church. Two different philosophies, two different engines, a hybrid model, and we're straddling that right now and, and trying to experiment because I think God has positioned New Day uniquely to do that in ways that he's just wired us for. So if things look different, that's why. Because we want to be a church that looks at what is God doing and how can we meet him there. And that's what God is doing around the world. Can we believe that he would do that in rural, central Wisconsin? We are God's masterpiece, a reflection of his heart, his creativity. And the reason we're doing this series, Made for More, is so that you can appreciate the ways God has uniquely created you. And then we can work together. Ordinary people believing. They're made new by Jesus Christ. Ordinary people believing that they're part of God's masterpiece. Ordinary people believing that God has good works planned for them. Ordinary people helping other ordinary people believe the same thing. You're an ordinary person. So am I. Are we willing to believe that we are part of God's masterpiece? Are you willing to believe? What are you willing to do about what God is teaching you? And who are you willing to share it with? Let's practice that pattern that we're, that we're practicing that we want to, I say practicing because we want to practice it here because this is the practice space. The idea is we take it to tables outside of this building, in our homes, 
in our workplace ba- break room, at a neighbor's house, uh, at, in the school cafeteria. What we practice here is reflection, application, discussion. So we're going to give you a few minutes to reflect. What is God teaching you? Please don't just be satisfied with what God is teaching me. Think about what is God teaching you? We're going to give you a couple of minutes to consider that quietly before we then discuss it with each other. So take these few minutes and reflect. Uh, I want to challenge you as you reflect, whenever you reflect about what God is teaching you to consider what are you willing to do about it. And uh, as I re- reflect on uh, Ephesians 2 and what God has been teaching me, I, I, I've been putting off a, a, a conversation that um, that, that I know uh, I, I need to have, but m- with people who I, I see incredible potential in, but what I also think I need to do is bring somebody along with me um, so that it's not like I am the key to unlocking other people's spiritual potential, uh, to bring someone with me to say, look, you can do this. Uh, you can help other people uh, perceive what, what God wants for them. So I, I have a, uh, an, an I will statement that's about not putting that conversation off any longer. Uh, I hope you have someone, even if you're tuning in online, you've got some people around you who you can have a conversation with because um, even though Christ has created us anew, we find our way around obedience. Um, we need each other. We need a community to help each other out, to encourage and to hold each other accountable. Uh, to, to doing God's will. So we're going to have conversations in this space, and I encourage you to have conversations wherever you are and talk about what are you willing to do in response to what God is teaching you, and who are you willing to share it with? Who could this message be an encouragement to in your life today, this week? So let's pray together 
and then move into conversation. God, thank you for your, your word, your promises. And even though it's, it's sometimes it's hard to believe, we just do. We surrender to you. We don't have to have it all figured out. We're not the artist. We're the masterpiece. You're the artist. I pray that our hearts, our minds, even our actions would be humbly submitted to you, Lord, to glorify and honor you in the world because we know what we do for your glory is also for our good and for the good of those people in our household, in our neighborhood, in our communities. God, may your kingdom come as your will is done in our community as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in. There are links to uh, help you do the, uh, the conflict style assessment before next Sunday. So please do that between now and next Sunday so you're ready for what's going to be a great message next week. Thank you. Go in peace. Mm-hmm.